Okay, I got it. Uh, so, the, yeah, who knows? Obviously, it didn't quit. Yeah. Maybe it there was a copy going on. How I made uh, the Orion Obsession video. So that, that's a video that I made um, earlier in the year, I think around, I finished it around uh, maybe late March or April. And here's what uh, Ken told you. Basically, uh, I knew about photography. I had a camera when I was, you know, uh, maybe seven years old. Uh, it was like a toy camera with film. Um, and, and and then uh, when my father passed, I, I got his camera. He had a, a Contax, which was a really nice camera for that time, and, and the Rolleiflex. Um and I started playing with those and I figured out, uh, oh, exposure is this and uh, whatever. So I kind of knew the the basics. Uh, I had some interactions with people that were into photography when I was about uh, 20 years. I had a couple of uh, a neighbor and a friend that wanted to be into in, in the movie industry, uh, cameraman, whatever. So they they were taking a lot of pictures and uh, uh, but I never really kind of like um, got I, I did appreciate photography I didn't really uh, get into actually taking pictures so after I came here um, I didn't have the cameras anymore so I got these cheap ones does anybody remember the Kodak disc um, and uh, yes the uh, so, well, finally, I said, "Okay, I I got the thing. I want to photograph clouds. I'm got I got I'm gonna get a a camera." And uh, I was just about to travel to Iceland. I said, "Well, I have to have a camera." Uh, th those pictures came out terrible. The, my iPhone got much better pictures. So I realized that I really need to know what I'm doing with the camera, and, and I learned that. Uh, and you know, I read the book from almost from one end to the other. Uh, and I started taking pictures, and I, I was um, also fascinated by um, time lapses. I saw this guy, Michael Binsky, um, is um, a photographer, and he's doing, uh, you know, cloud, uh, these big cloud storms, whatever, not necessarily tornadoes, just uh, the big clouds, and, and he's got some absolutely fascinating videos and i said i have to learn how to do that um and i also tried to do some night pictures and of course they came out horribly and then finally two years after i got the camera i got some decent pictures um after a trip to north south lake with the uh AAA. um and uh at that point, I thought, yeah, okay, nice. Now I'm, I'm going to take a lot of these. And I got a lot of clips. Um, the sky in October, the sky in November, the sky in whatever. Uh, but somehow they just don't have, you know, they kind of they get boring. So then I discovered the secret, the music. And I'll get to that. So anyway, uh, so now I'm making time lapses with music uh, composed of multiple clips. All right, so that's a history. How about uh, what, what's involved in taking a picture at night? So let's start with like very simple things and I don't mean to make this a tutorial. Uh, Oh, look at this. We we see you, George. We just we just don't see your presentation. Huh. Weird stuff happening here. Yeah, let me get to the Zoom. Um, where is Zoom? Here, this is Zoom. 
Yeah, I minimize the screen, share screen. Okay, share sound, optimize video clip, share. So you see my screen now, right? My presentation again. I clicked on it. Everything is in slow Look, motion. Looks good. <clears throat> yeah. So this is from Big Band. Um, you want the fast lens, 2.8 of uh, ratio or less. Um, a wide angle, let's say 12 millimeter to 35. Of course, you have to have long exposure, use high ISO. Uh, a full frame camera will give better pictures than a less than full frame camera. To, for a time lapse, you need an intervalometer. Of course, you need a tripod because you got to keep the camera stable. And here are some settings. Uh, and I put them out there. This would be like a starting point, And you can move up, down, depending on your circumstances and um, your limitations. I, um, I, I'm putting that out there because people ask the question, well, what was your exposure? And uh, if you start uh, taking a uh, time lapse, now you have an intervalometer, you start taking a time lapse, then you have to start calculating uh, how many frames you will need and how long it's going to take. And the movie is usually played at somewhere between 24 uh, to 30 frames per second. So that, these are some standards. Uh, that come, some of them come from the old uh, regular film cameras and uh, how they sh were showing them on TV and so on. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of like roughly, I, you can pick 24 or 30 or somewhere near, there's like a 23.9 something, doesn't really make a difference. So to uh, make a 10 second clip you need either 240 or 300 frames of course you can make the movie in slower motion meaning that you're going to use half of the speed but then it can get choppy it depends and um, uh, if you are going to take a picture every 15 seconds your exposure cannot be longer than 15 seconds. So basically, whatever your exposure is, is going to tell you how often you can take the pictures. You typically don't want a break between exposures because, again, you lose some of the movement. Uh, so with this in mind, uh, if you run at 15 seconds, uh, to get 300 frames, it's going to be an hour and 15 minutes. Right, so I usually aim for 10, 10 seconds or more. So time-lapse versus still night photography. Um, time-lapse is more difficult uh, from uh, some point of view because once you start, you cannot change most things. Uh, with my camera, I can change the exposure, for instance, but that's about it. Uh, and uh, you cannot change the scene. You have somebody, uh, a friend come over with a flashlight or something, it's ruined. Uh, you have to start over. Um, and uh, in general, because it takes longer, you, uh, you cannot get to do so many things. A photographer will move around, will try angles and so on. You have to do this ahead of time, figure something, and once you start, it's over. Um, now, in a sense, time lapse is more forgiving. The, because star trails and details in general are really not that noticeable. People get their attention on the movement and, uh, you know, all sorts of things kind of get sh shoved under the rug, so to say. Uh, 
Not necessarily, but uh, and in fact, most of the times, no. But I get to that, actually. I do cover that uh, tracking. No, no problem. Um, interrupt me anytime you want. Uh, it, I, I feel better if I do get questions. So um, I guess the prime object that people uh, photograph uh, at night uh, is, uh, well, I don't know if I really it is, but anyway, for me, it would be the Milky Way, but uh, the Milky Way, the Milky Way core is not visible in winter. And uh, although there is an interesting part of the Milky Way, uh, what else is there that uh, offer like a, a variety of uh, features and possible, pos possible shots and so on? It, it is Orion. So uh, I wanted to do something about it and try a, a few things, uh, how to show Orion. And uh, by the way, since then, I think I have more ideas, but that's what I was able to do in that time. Uh, in the time frame in January, it occurred to me, oh, it's getting late. Let me start. You should have started earlier, maybe as early as uh, late November. So, the f one of the first shots in my backyard. So, what did I do here? Uh, I used a 35 millimeter lens. I used a diffusion filter, and that's why I get the spikes. Uh, and um, for Ken, who's not here, I'm sure he would have asked what filter. It's a Koken V830. And uh, this one, I, I call this pseudo tract. That's my term. I don't know if anybody else uses it. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm not tracking, but in software, I can simulate following the target. So um, I'll show you the, the, the clip in a second, see what I do. But uh, uh, about shooting at home, I thought I'll. Uh, throw out a few things there. They, obviously, it's easier because you just walk out, but you really have to be careful. The uh, the lights in the house, and if you leave a light on, it will just shine so brightly. It appears so brightly, uh, so bright. Uh, it, uh, you really have to dim everything down and, in fact, use very small lights. You do want to have the windows lit a little bit, but it's going to be one of those night lights that uh, turn on when it gets dark or something like that, something very, very faint or a light um, in a room that doesn't have a window you know, towards the camera and you just see some light coming out through the door and something like this. And unfortunately for me, I'm kind of limited by the trees, um, but uh, it adds an element of uh, kind of um, I don't know. People tell me that, oh, look how nice it looks, how it goes down through the trees. Anyway, here's the clip. I hope it's not too jumpy. So Orion stays pretty much in the frame, although normally you would have left. I mean, you see the, the trees coming in the picture and, and so on. And you can see the spikes. The spikes are uh, intentional. And uh, the, the idea is that they emphasize the brighter stars. And, and this way, you can recognize the constellations. It's easier to see the constellations. Um, another shot here. Uh, this is a shot that uh, almost never was because I show up at this place, which is a little more than half an hour from my place. And I, I use it often. It's the uh, Shahola Marsh Reservoir. And uh, it's pretty dark there. Um, it, and it's open. Uh, it doesn't have that many trees around, especially if you go near the uh, lake itself. So I get there, uh, I had two cameras, plus I had just 
I received a, a third camera and I was going to try it. Um, and I, I have three cameras, I have two tripods, uh, but uh, with the tripod heads, but the cameras, I didn't have the plates. Uh, I had just rearranged everything and I forgot to put the plates back on the cameras. So I'm there and it's, I'm like a hunter with, with the gun and everything and you don't have the bullets. So what am I gonna do? So I ended up putting the camera on, there is a little deck there, uh, kind of like at the edge of the lake and it has uh, uh, a, a, a rail around it and it's pretty the top is pretty wide so i put the camera down i supported it with something i pressed the button and i let it go and this is what came out uh what i'm doing here uh is uh, this thing called date tonight can be night today as well uh where your you have to change the exposure uh one way or another uh, so that uh, you go from a relatively bright sky to a dark sky. And you can do this in two ways. You can use aperture priority uh, or you can use manual adjustment. Either uh, of them has some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, aperture priority is easy, but uh, you don't really know how you're going to end up Um a manual adjustment you have to be on top of the camera and keep changing it and you still don't really know what the final adjustment uh will be so it's a little bit of um i i, I guess guessing or experience or or planning um involved in in this uh the um the manual adjustment uh is safer in a sense uh, than the aperture priority, but uh, it involves a little more work. And uh, then the other thing that I did here is again this uh, fake pseudo tracking. Uh, and basically adding motion, even if this is already moving, the constellation is, uh, you know, the stars are moving, you do want to change the frame a little bit uh, maybe uh, zoom in, zoom out, you know, just create some uh, additional movement to give it a more cinematic feel. So here is the day to night uh, as the sky gets darker and the constellation becomes more uh, visible. And also, I'm slightly zooming in and obviously uh, tracking it uh, again in uh, software. George, I got a quick question. Were you zooming in? Uh, you uh, was, was that an artificial zoom or was that like a real zoom with the lens? Yeah, the artificial zoom. Right. Pseudo fake zoom. Okay. Uh, and and I, I do actually have at the very end uh, kind of uh, I explain how that's done. Thank you. Uh, another day tonight, but uh, and here I'm using a tracker, but I'm really uh, cheating. So uh, basically, uh, I put the tracker in horizontal position as if I were at the North Pole. And the camera on top of it will rotate 15 degrees an hour. Uh, the objects in the sky um, move on a sort of a diagonal, uh, about 15 degrees an hour. So it kind of keeps pace with them. I mean, it's not uh, that they're going to be always um, pointing exactly in that direction, but uh, it does, uh, you know, help. And it creates that movement. Uh, also, notice uh, you know you see objects uh, in the house. Um, I, I had some other shots in, in not for something else where uh, you could see the handlebars of the exercise bike, and you know these things that you, you don't really want people to see. And by the way, this little red thing here is a. Uh, amount so i don't know if it's recognizable but that's something that 
I want people to see. So here's a clip. So I'm basically just moving the camera horizontally. And here the tracker stopped. I don't remember if I stopped it on purpose. So if you see at some point that, that the trees are not moving anymore. And I frankly, I don't remember why I did this or if I did it intentionally altogether, but that's a possibility. You can kind of let things flow by themselves. Okay, one more shot from home. Uh, and again, this is a pseudo tract and I'm, I'm done with the home stuff. And we end up in the trees almost. So now I wanted to do something different. And uh, what I did, uh, I, I wanted to show a Barnard's loop, uh, make, make it uh, appear and uh, anything else that's uh, read in the image with the Astro modified camera. And uh, so this is on a tracker, polar aligned and everything. So it is following Barnard, I'm sorry, uh, it, it is following Orion. Um, the, but I needed to make a, a time lapse so uh, the images are not stacked. It, it, these are just single images that are made into a, a movie. So you'll see it's a flickering a little bit as the atmospheric conditions change. And then it goes into the trees. Uh, I I would have to go to find the pictures and uh, look again, but typically, you know, 15 seconds each. Yeah, it could be maybe a little more. I don't know because that's uh, if you want if you want to gather that uh, red light, you probably want to have longer exposures to to get that. Maybe maybe it may go up to even thirty seconds. It's definitely not more than thirty seconds. I can tell you this for sure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Uh, I, I did, but I mean, uh, it was a while back. So, so I, I, I'll have to go back and check every movie and so on. And um, yeah, uh, but all right. So now this is with a different lens, and I think I'm not sure if this. Is, oh yeah, it says TPO 180 millimeter focal length. So this is a small scope, uh, 40 millimeter. Uh, aperture and again it's on the tracker this is the a small tracker uh, that has served me very well uh, and I'm uh, th th this is also an exercise in bed planning but I, I guess I was in a hurry I didn't want to miss this uh, by the way because of the trees I also have issues uh, finding a spot where I can do the polar alignment uh, so I'm kind of pushed in one direction and uh, I I may, you know, basically, uh, this these pictures will. I mean, the the object will go into the trees uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, the other thing was that the house was in the way. So again, these are single shots that are tracked. And uh, zooming out is artificial. Here's the house. And then I broke the movie into two and I have one before the house roof and, and then after the house. And you'll see that in the movie, actually the transition was pretty smooth and 
I did not get any sort of criticism on on that. Somehow that worked. That's why I I, I said that uh, it is more uh, it, it's more tolerant. Time lapses from some standpoints uh, are are more tolerant. And with all those pictures that I took for Orion, uh, I stacked them and I got this shot here, which I think it's much clearer, sharper, uh, especially the uh, Barnard loop. Uh, and, and here we have uh, the Rosette Nebula. The, uh, the stars here have spikes because of the lens. I did not use a filter here. Astromodified. So a camera would come with a filter that blocks ultraviolet and kind of tapers down in the red region. So this blue, kind of lighter blue line is the regular um, you know, filter. Uh, the regular curve, and you can see that in where it hits the H alpha line, the H alpha line is the more intense blue. It's really down here to like 25%, doesn't let all that out. And also there is the sulfur two line, uh, and there is even less of that. The astro modification consists of replacing this filter with another one. Uh, and there would be this brown line, which is almost flat at the top and then just drops down after uh, whatever this would be, 675 uh, or so, drops down. So it allows a lot more um, H-alpha and sulfur too, uh, deeper reds. So this is Orion's head, uh, the uh, Lamb Lambda Orionis. Orionis. You, you can recognize the the three stars that. Uh, and the, here's Betelgeuse um, that make Orion's head. And you see, there is this reddish uh, glow here, which is captured by the camera, an astro modified camera. So I was intrigued by it. Uh, I did not know what that was. Uh, so I started looking it up and I, I learned that's actually um, a sort of a nebula that that's called uh, the uh, goldfish or something like that. And to me, it does look like a goldfish if you see this, uh, this would be the the uh, fish tank fish. So this is with an actual additional filter. And this may have been a longer exposure, maybe a minute, um, obviously tracked. And I use the filter that you put inside the camera. It's a 12 millimeter H alpha, uh, 12 nanometer uh, H alpha filter. All right, so I'm at a point where I have some material and now I'm looking for something at the uh, other end of uh, Orion's uh, move in the sky. So it's March and I'm looking for some um, pictures where Orion sits. So I go again to the uh, Shahola Marsh uh, and um, here I, I'm using a 12 millimeter lens. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to see that it came, the Milky Way came out in the picture pretty nicely too. So you have Orion here and then um, Milky Way. Those are airplanes. Obviously, we are on a route with all those airplanes going in uh, in that direction and i also like how the trees came uh these trees came out here in the in silhouette 
And while this is shooting, I take out my other camera, my newer camera, and I'm thinking, well, maybe there is something I can do with it. I, there, by the way, you know, you, you have an hour to kill or, or an hour and a half to kill. Uh, you try things or you read things or so I'm I'm looking and I see that the or the I see the Orion reflection in the water. And that was a really, really lucky um shot. And I I'll play that to you and I figured uh this would be uh, a great shot to kind of finish the uh, uh the movie kind of like a closing a closing shot all right so now i have all the clips so what do i do here's a, a, a really confusing thing that i decided not to go over with uh but i just going to tell you that i'm using this program called LR time lapse and I'm using Lightroom. LR time lapse LR stands not for Lightroom but for level and ramp is developed by a German guy um who is kind of self-taught I think um but he kind of figured out how things are done with uh how lightroom works and what he can do with it uh, and uh, develop this program uh that will take your pictures uh your time lapse pictures and will make a movie it works hand in hand with lightroom uh lightroom processes the pictures and this program puts them together and I'll kind of skip this for now because uh, I have an example at the very end if anybody is really interested. So what is the secret secret sauce uh, in this? And it is music. Um, and I got convinced of that, not, not only when I started using it, but also I, I watched the documentary about uh, music for uh, that um, for movies, and they were um, you know having interviews with the various um, composers, which are you know the current composers, and they tell you what you know how what's involved in this, and uh, it really the the music really drives uh, the, the mood and, uh, and so on. So if you have, uh, you know, music that is scary, it's going to be a, a certain feeling. If you have, uh, uplifting music or calming music or whatever, that's gonna basically tell you what that, uh, movie is about, section of the movie is about. Um, and I use a subscription service because I don't want to be caught uh, and sent to jail because I'm using. No, I I think Instagram will take down your movies uh, if they think that you're stealing somebody's uh, uh, work, uh, musical work. So I'm using the service that I pay a su subscription and they say, with us, uh, you're covered. We have your back. So. Now I have all the clips, and, and what do I do with them? So I'm kind of thinking, okay, let's say let me let me lay them in a certain order so that there is some sort of introduction and also a little bit of variety, and then some change, and then we go back to the initial theme or whatever, something like that. Uh, and let's see how long it is, how how they, what it looks like. Um, then I start uh, looking for um, a piece of music for it. And once I find something that I think, uh, and by the way, it's a struggle because um, I never really liked the music until I really know I like it. So I tried this, I tried that. And then finally there is one that says, all right, this is it. Uh, and um, now I try to do this 
they I try to match the changes in music uh, with actually the uh, the clips as I go from one to the other. And uh, hopefully you're going to be able to notice this. It's, it's not for every single clip, but it's kind of like the major part. So this uh, piece of music I sort of uh, counted. I'm not really the bars because I don't have the notes, um, but uh, I figured out, all right, so here's this segment gets repeated that many times, and then the whole thing gets repeated um, at a different level. It's more intense or more calm or whatever. And I try to put that on top of the clip so that there is some transition there. Um, all this is done, or I do all this in a program called iMovie, which is standard on iPhone and iPad. And I think it is on Macs, but I'm not a Mac user. So I'm doing all, all this work on, uh, on an iPad. And this is what it looks like. Uh, basically, uh, you, you have down here, we have the clips. And you can edit them, make them longer, shorter. Uh, you can speed them up or slow them down to some extent. And down here we have the music. And you can cut this short uh, or long or whatever. You can fade. Uh, you can add some titles. <clears throat> and uh, so here's the, the whole movie. And there should be sound. Can you hear the sound? Yes, I hear the sound. So this is the end of the first part of the music, the melody, and gets like a second one gets more intense. Watch the transition over the house, the unintentional for planning. And now we are winding down. And I always like to finish with some shot that will be kind of, uh, all right, this is it. I kind of a final shot. So that's the, uh, stacked picture so oh tools uh sony a7 three cameras one astro modified lenses um 
I also use uh, lenses. Sony lenses are wonderful. I love them. They're so good. Um, I use Rockin' on, but they're expensive. I use Rockin' on lenses, um, just manual. I for for astrophotography, you don't need all the focus and all the stuff because you do things manually anyway. Um, so I use the lenses twelve, and I have two. 12 millimeters, the super wide and uh, longer focal length, 135 millimeters, and the little telescope, uh, very portable, and the little tracker, um, LR time lapse uh, for software, Lightroom, uh, and iMovie. So now you know everything. Uh, I, I, I was going to show you um, how the um how this works if you're not uh bored at this point i don't know what time is it uh yeah all right so this is lr time lapse lrt and uh i have a uh sequence here I, i'm not actually going to do it live but i i took these shots of uh, kind of uh the intermediate steps uh, and you give it a folder with uh, uh, your pictures, and it will load them, and you'll get all this information here. Uh, the aperture, speed chart, so it knows everything about those frames. Uh, and it will create, based on the information in the frames, uh, the, there's the X, I, a, EXIF, if information in the frames, it will create a, a bunch of fi uh, files called EMP, I believe, dot EMP. Uh, so th these are the files that Lightroom and Photoshop and the other uh, Adobe programs understand. A and those uh, will also describe a bunch of other parameters uh, I may have an example here at some point, but anyway, in this program, now I select two keyframes. I can select more than, or or just one keyframe. Uh, but I selected two keyframes, the first one, and if I were to scroll down, you'd see that the last one is also selected. And in this display, you'll see this little sign here that shows it's a keyframe. I take all this information now and I go to Lightroom. And Lightroom will load the information and uh, it will show me the keyframes. And the keyframes look kind of dingy. And uh, I mean, obviously, they need some work here. Uh, so I edit the first keyframe uh, and I edit the second keyframe. And uh, here is how I decided to do it for the purpose of this. So basically, I brightened up the first one. I made I increased some contrast, whatever. In, in the second one, I applied the same changes as far as um, exposure, contrast, and so on. Uh, and I also zoom in. So this is the the magic. And at this point, I take these the information for these two keyframes and I put them back into LR time lapse. LR time lapse will recognize, ah, I have something here. And uh, it'll show these lines that I never actually understood what they what uh, him means with them. Um, the more changes you make, the more lines you'll get here. But uh, anyway, you click on this auto transition. So all these parameters that I changed, let's say exposure, I increased the exposure uh, in the first frame by, I don't know, uh, 1.5. And in the last frame, I increased it uh, by 2. Then. LR time lapse will calculate how much you have to increase each single frame out of these 100 that I have in this uh, example clip to have a smooth transition 
from in, an increase of 1.5 to an increase of 1.2. The same thing with uh, uh, the frame, the, the cropping. So there are parameters that show you, show or describe the cropping. Uh, there are parameters that describe every single thing that you can do in, or almost, uh, I guess I, I shouldn't uh, generalize quite like that, but uh, pretty much uh, everything that you change in Lightroom uh, it, it will uh, be described by a one or more parameters in this dot emp file, and it gets passed uh, now. Uh, right, so this is initially, and then after I did the uh, conversion, it will be. And I skip one. No, it'll be passed back into Lightroom. So now Lightroom has all that information. Uh, LR time lapse cannot produce the actual pictures. It, it's not meant for that. It's not good at that. Uh, you need high quality pictures, and that's where LR time lapse. I mean, uh, Lightroom comes into play. So Lightroom now has the information describing how these pictures should look like. It applies that information to the pictures. And what I do now, I say export, uh, and it will actually write all these into a folder that gets passed back on to LR time lapse. And LR time lapse will say, okay, I have the frames, I can make the movie. How would you like it to come out? And this is the display that allows you to decide when you render you actually render the movie you select uh, the frame rate uh, you can select the number of speeds i sometimes uh, i choose half speed um, if i don't have enough frames i'm cheating but i don't really like to do that i usually use 24 or 30. Um, a bunch of other things that uh, you know the how the quality, uh, the uh, encoding, which is MP4 for for my version, which is not the professional one. It that's the only one that I can do. And I click render, render video, and uh, it'll make the video, and uh, and that's that. And, and here's the end of my presentation. George, oh. George, oh, thank you. <laughs> that's that. That's really cool. You you mentioned two key, key frames in LR time lapse. Can can you do things like use three key yeah. frames yeah. and zoom in for the first half and zoom out for out for the second no. half? No, that they that LR time lapse for some reason only allows you to do the first and last for zooming everything else you change you can change you can have you know 15 keyframes if you are so inclined um but uh not for zooming okay thanks well, Oh, all right, so so this is this is just a display of the direct the the folders that I have. So don't don't be confused by this one. So here is where I select. Oh, these here, uh, the, the this show you to what extent you processed them. In a lot of time lapse, if if. Yes, if you did this and that, and what if you didn't do this or that? Uh, so I think this means uh, this symbol would mean uh, that you selected keyframes. Um, here it uh, may be that you did that auto transition, or you can actually see the symbol here. See up and down. See the auto transition. This one is to gen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so th these are all folders. 
separate folders. This is my work over, uh, I don't know, uh, a year or two or whatever it, it sees on, on my computer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to kind of get All right, so so this is the okay, I said the EMP, this is actually XMP file. And you can see that this is, describes an image with the modifications or, or without modifications, whatever. Uh here's the temperature, uh the tint, the exposure, the contrast, highlights, shadows. So, so all these are parameters that you see in Lightroom. And, and, and so Lightroom will um, basically decide on what this is, the haze, right, the vibrance. Uh, and, and then LRT will make the calculation how to go from file A, first one, to the final file, step by step, in a smooth, in a smooth manner. I think I have this here, right? Um, yeah, this is actually live, uh, and um, yeah, and it comes out kind of like this. And it's not totally smooth, but then it has this visual deflicker. It, it, it cracks me up when this guy, Gunther, I forget his last name, because uh, he's German. And uh, as an immigrant, I can make fun of other uh, other accents, right? So in, in because he's German, he says, deflicker, deflicker. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, and, uh, but he's a genius though. I mean, this, this is the premier program to make, uh, uh, to make videos. A lot, a lot of very advanced people use it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is not a video editing program. Um, so, so John, John asked, uh, what about, uh, you know, the zooming in, zooming out? Well, you, you can break your clip in two if you want to do this. I mean, it's more work, but you, you can do that. So you're going to have. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and many any kind of move, uh, panning, whatever you can pan and zoom at the same time, and and everything. Of course, when you do this, it means that you crop and you kind of lose part of the image. But uh, that's why uh, sometimes I prefer to use the tracker to just do the panning, the slow panning from left to right. Yeah, so you can actually see what you've got here with by pressing this thing, and it will play. Uh, it will play it back to you. And um, it, it has, by the way, this display is, um, has a lot more to it. So it's got basically everything that you can change. It has it listed here with the values. And you'll see crop left, okay, let's just Keep take take this one, and you'll see it's point uh, zero fourteen, point zero seventeen, point twenty one, and so on. So it goes on all the way to the end, and that's how it's to point three thirty eight. So 
you can see how that's done now, right? Yeah. Roger, yeah. I just want to uh, inj inject a comment that has nothing to do with software. There are two things that impressed me about everything you showed tonight. Number one is that all the skies look natural. None of the star colors are gaudy. None of the sky backgrounds are screaming colors that nobody has ever seen in nature. And you have a way, and I've noticed this for all the years that you've been putting stuff up, you have a way of putting the right music at, at, with the right transitions. Boy, back in the days when planetariums did star shows, you could have had quite a career. It wouldn't pay as well as what you're probably doing now, <laughs> but you're really good at it. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I got to say that uh, uh, I, I cannot uh, exaggerate the sky because Stan will not accept that from me. <laughs> So, uh, by the way, so my formal education uh, in photography is two classes with Stan. The same class twice, I should say. <laughs> Could I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to go back and, uh, since it's being recorded, I'm going to go back and watch it carefully to try to understand everything. But if I don't understand something later, can I contact you? Oh, yeah, my pleasure, sure. So yeah, go ahead. Sure.